Amen and amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Back to the Beatitudes and to the finest introduction ever given to the most famous sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. It's that important. And if you want to keep first things first in your life, keep the main thing the main thing, it's hard to beat Jesus' Beatitudes. For getting back to the basics, these eight sacred paradoxes, eight successive secrets to a true happiness in a miserable world, to a satisfying life in a dissatisfied age. Today, the fourth beatitude, number four, on Jesus' eight-point checklist, you could say, to know if you are truly a citizen of his kingdom or not. Eight vital signs, if you will, to look for in God's emergency room. How to check your spiritual pulse. The Lord is helping us through his word as he does in the whole book of 1 John, as the whole epistle to James and in many other places. And so here in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes, the Lord is, is bringing our finger to our pulse, as it were, and helping you to check, am I alive in Christ or not? Do I have eternal life? Am I saved? How can I be sure? Am I truly born again? Am I on the narrow road that leads to heaven or am I on the broad road that leads to eternal destruction? The Beatitudes also serve, friends, as an eight-question self-exam for revival, for spiritual awakening in your life, in our church. Think about the first Beatitude back in verse 3. Do I, do we, are we poor in spirit? That's, those are the ones who have the kingdom of heaven. In other words, do I truly see my own spiritual bankruptcy and utter poverty? Do I admit my guilt and inability and need for Christ to save me and to grow me? Second beatitude, remember verse four. Do I, do we mourn over sin that we might know God's comfort Is there a holy grief? Is there a righteous sorrow? Is there a godly remorse and a contrite brokenness over sin, my own sin, the sin of others, the sin in our world? A grief that only God can comfort and relieve. And then the third beatitude, if you recall in verse 5, am I meek? Is there a meek gentleness about my life that shows those who will inherit the earth one day? Do I display strength under control? Am I yielded to God and for the good of others? And now we come to this one. Let me just read it in the interest of time and then we will pray. The fourth beatitude, verse 6 in Matthew 5. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Please join me as we pray. Our Father, Please wean us off of junk food and idols. We confess we have lived far too long on a kind of spiritual McDonald's. And sadly, we live in an age where many just feed it and they deliver it and they promote it. Weak doctrines, bad doctrines, false doctrines. Sheep are left without a shepherd. The souls are starving and malnourished. And so with the psalmist, O Lord, each of us pray, incline our hearts to your law. Change our appetites. Turn our eyes away from dishonest gain. Show us the real riches found in you alone and in your word. Keep changing the price tags for us as we saw last week. Keep fixing and adjusting for us that we might devalue what the world wrongly values and what Satan lies to us about and that we might revalue and rightly assess true worth, real beauty, actual goodness, lasting satisfaction, genuine happiness in the midst of a deceived and a very confused and empty and miserable world. Save lost souls in this room now. and Strengthen your people. Satisfy our hearts. We cannot live by bread alone, O oh Lord. As Jesus himself declared while he fasted in the wilderness and as he now teaches us the way of true satisfaction. By your spirit, Lord, 
fill us with the bread of heaven till we want no more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our title this morning is Come and Dine. Come and Dine. Remember that lovely scene on the beach when the risen Lord Jesus Christ prepared breakfast for his boys, for the 12 disciples there in John 21. And he said to them after the fish had been roasted, perhaps instantly, by the glorified Christ, and breakfast was served, and Jesus said those words, come and dine. Simple words of warm invitation. Summing up the message of this fourth beatitude here in verse 6 and really capturing the whole story of the Bible and of salvation and of the entire Christian life. As Isaiah 55 puts it, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. You can't buy it, you can't work for it, you can't earn it, right? It's by grace alone. As Isaiah goes on to say, Listen diligently to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear. Come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Or how about Psalm 34? Finish the sentence for me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed. That's a beatitude. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. No wonder then that the Lord's table is the symbol of our faith, that a supper with Jesus at the head of the meal symbolizes our fellowship and our satisfaction in the gospel, in the cross of Christ, that every time we come, we hear the words of the Lord, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Drink, this is my blood, spilt, poured out for you. Come and dine. Song of Solomon, the bride sings of her groom. Remember, he brought me into the banqueting house. His banner over me is love. Love delights to satisfy the beloved. And so in this fourth beatitude, Jesus sets the table for us. He lays out a lavish banquet. He spread a most satisfying meal. And I hope you came hungry this morning. I told the 8 a.m. people, you have an advantage because you're more likely to be thinking about lunch by the end of this sermon. Imagine when we had three services, right? Uh, There was hunger, especially the preacher. Uh, I hope you brought this morning a huge appetite for a mouth-watering message from God's Word. We're going to look at three aspects this morning. Three aspects of God's fabulous feast offered to all who come and dine All who admit that the world has left them empty and the junk foods and the empty idols and the cheap thrills and the passing pleasures and the false treasures of this world have left them dry and barren and parched with thirst. All who will come and dine, the Lord lays out for them a fabulous feast. First we'll see the purpose and then the pursuit and then the promise. Purpose, the pursuit, and the promise. Let's look at the purpose, first of all, in verse 6b, you could say, the middle of verse 6. And when we talk about the purpose, really, this is the destination. Where are we to go? And then he's going to show us how to get there. Jesus here uses, for the first time, a key foundational term throughout the Sermon on the Mount and throughout Matthew's Gospel. If we are to be salivating licking our lips over this mouth-watering meal for ravenous hunger, then we need to see what God has set on the table and not confuse it with something else or anything else. The word in verse 6 is righteousness. Think about it, friends. Inseparable with our blessedness, essential to our bliss and our joy is righteousness. And yet think about paradise. Before the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, before we blew it, mankind was perfectly righteous and completely happy. But sin stole our gladness. Disobedience robs joy. Unrighteousness steals satisfaction. And to get it back, we require, God requires righteousness. There are no shortcuts. There is no other bypass or back avenue or way to get it. 
So we need to answer what kind of righteousness is our Lord speaking of here in verse 6. And I ask you not to read the Apostle Paul into the Apostle Matthew. Don't cram Romans or Galatians into this Sermon on the Mount, even though yesterday was Reformation Day, and we are proud in the right sense. We boast in the gospel and the, the truth of the Protestant faith. There is lots of overlap, for sure. This is God's word. He's the author of all, and Scripture has a unity about it, but context is king, and we must let Jesus and Matthew first speak for itself. Galatians and Romans are about justification, God's free gift of legal righteousness by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, sola, sola, sola. But Matthew uses the term differently, and Jesus does here. And it has less to do with justification and more to do with sanctification. It's not about legal righteousness, it's about moral and personal righteousness. Just think of how Matthew's used this term. First of all, let me define it for you. It's really complicated. I'll give it to you in the original Greek. Righteousness means doing right. <laughs> Whoa. That's deep. Doing right. Upright living. Holy behavior. Godly conduct. Obeying God's law. Doing his will. Performing his statutes. Chapter 1, verse 19, Joseph was a righteous man. Chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He kept the law for us. Chapter 5, look down at verse 10, just in a few verses from here. Those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, following Christ, obeying the Lord. Look down at verse 20. Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. You must have a holy life. Verse 45, he talks about the rain and the sun shine and fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, the saved and the unsaved, believers and unbelievers. Chapter 6 begins, beware of practicing your righteousness before men. And then he goes on to talk about prayer and fasting and generosity, areas of Christian obedience. And then verse 33, at the end of Matthew 6, the famous one that we have to say in the King James, don't we? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, hunger and thirst for crave it. It's the king's righteousness. It's obeying the king's laws. It's following his commands. And the summary, in many ways, of the whole Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want to treat them to treat you. Right? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. The golden rule. For this is the law and the Christian righteousness and our obedience to God's law. And go back to the Beatitudes. Surely this fourth Beatitude must flow out of and be born and birthed out of the first three. Those who are poor in spirit and who mourn and who are meekly gentle. Hunger and thirst, they crave for this kind of Right living, which, notice, keep reading, produces a mercifulness towards others, a purity of heart, a peace-making. So, even Martin Luther himself, by the way, our Reformation hero, took this same view. It was only his disciple, as is often the case, we try and outdo our leader and our, 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 our mentor, and it was Melanchthon who inspired the Protestant trend ever since to uh, uh, perhaps read Romans a bit too quickly into Matthew. To hunger for this kind of righteousness must mean yearning to see God's standards established everywhere. To thirst for this righteousness means to long for his law to be obeyed in every time, in every place, in every situation, in every circumstance, in every decision, in my life, in your life, in his life, in her life, in their life, in everywhere. Righteousness. And for the Christian, finish line is crystal clear. We... We know the exact race that has been set out for us, as Scripture says. We know where we are running. The goal is set. Our aim is sure. The, our purpose is plain. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. Philippians 3, that I may know him and be like him, be conformed to his image. Uh, forgetting what is behind, I, I reach for the prize to be like Christ. Romans 8, why did God elect and predestine me and every believer? 
that we might be conformed to the image of his son. Why is he working all things together for good? That we might be more like Christ. Hebrews 12, pursue holiness without which no one can see the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, for this is the will of God. You want to know what God wants you to do today, this week? I guarantee you, he wants you to be holy, sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 4, it says it twice. 1 Timothy 4, train yourself for godliness. 1 Timothy 6, but you, man of God, flee from these worldly things and pursue righteousness and godliness. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now I know some, I trust many of you, theologically astute, alert minds are thinking, does this mean we earn salvation, we achieve righteousness? No. Newsflash. Please hear this caveat. The road of sanctification begins with justification. That's surely implied here. The the path to practical holiness begins with positional holiness at salvation, or to use even a little more a theological term, the way to imparted moral righteousness begins with imputed legal righteousness. You can't get sanctified if you're not justified. You can't live the Christian life if you're not alive to be incredibly profound. <laughs> if you're still dead in your sins, Christ is not calling here for corpse cosmetics, window dressing, and rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You must be born again, Jesus said, to a very moral, outwardly righteous Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And so if a person truly hungers and thirsts for a more pure and godly life, it's because they have already been regenerated and born again. And for some who have an active conscience and want to be free of enslaving sin and filth and they want to clean up their life, but they haven't been reborn. They first need to be converted. You can't have a new life without a new heart. You won't have new behavior until you get made new. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, right? 2 Corinthians 5 tells us. To live out Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, you need Romans and Galatians and the doctrine of justification by faith alone. You need 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, one of the great Protestant Reformation uh, linchpin anchor texts that we treasure. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him, the great exchange. We say hallelujah to that. But it's not Jesus' main point here and it's not the language of Matthew at all. For the Christian, all unrighteousness, every failure we see, especially in our own lives or anywhere else, every failure to love God wholeheartedly, to love others unselfishly, all unrighteousness grieves us privately, publicly, inwardly, outwardly, near or far. And it makes us homesick for Christ's coming kingdom, for the perfection of the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells, as Scripture tells us. So let's go back to that, those opening eight questions for self-exam, for personal revival and spiritual awakening. This then would be the fourth question from the fourth beatitude. Am I hungry and thirsty for rightness in every realm of my life with God, with others, in every situation and circumstance. And by the way, one other application and warning. Today, so-called social justice is neither social nor just, and most of all, it is not biblical justice. Please listen. Beware, that is all the rage. It's the bandwagon everyone's jumping on, and it's splitting churches, It's dividing denominations. It's causing great confusion and compromise. Socialjusticestatement.com. Very helpful. Socialjusticestatement, one word, dot com. Also, Shepherd Seminary, our own faculty, did a statement on this just a couple of months ago on the so-called woke church and social justice. But from the socialjusticestatement.com, listen to Samuel Say, an excellent Christian African-American 
voice. He says this, a society that embraces neo-Marxism and distributes wealth and privileges between groups will inevitably violate an individual's right to life and liberty. Social justice doesn't fight racism, it fosters it. It doesn't defend human rights, it destroys them. Social justice, he says, is about perceived injustice, not proven injustice. It is an unending, unhelpful, unsatisfying thirst that can never be quenched as they try to fill broken cisterns, to use the language of Scripture. And he concludes, social justice does not affirm human rights and it does not advance the gospel. We must define it biblically. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Number two, we've looked at the purpose. Where are we going? The destination, you could say. And now comes the journey. How do we get there? Second point, the pursuit. I need to warn you, because the parallel Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6 have a sting in them that isn't found in Matthew 5. Because with all the blessings in Luke 6, there is also a parallel woe an anathema, a pronouncing of God's punishment and wrath and justice. And here's how it reads in Luke 6. Jesus says, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. But woe, cursing, in other words, to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Did you hear that? There's no third option. There's no middle path. There's no Switzerland neutral ground. Either you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness in this life and you find in Christ alone and from the Lord satisfaction now and forevermore, either you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness or you are well fed, you are self-satisfied, you've ignored the first three beatitudes, you're proud in spirit, you don't mourn over sin, you are self-righteous and self-satisfied, I'm fine Lord, I'm just doing okay, thank you very much, I don't need you. You are well fed and you will hunger eternally. You will your teeth in outer darkness in the lake of fire and never be satisfied. If you won't hunger now, you'll hunger forever. What is your choice? Which will it be? Do these holy hunger pains look like here? In the beginning of verse 6, verse 6a, we could say, we've seen the purpose. Now look at the pursuit, friends. He says, blessed are those. Notice, he doesn't say those who hungered and thirsted once upon a time. Uh, blessed are those who get hungry and occasionally feel thirsty. No. He doesn't say blessed are those who were hungry and thirsty. No. no. In the original, it is a present active participle. Literally. Blessed are those who are hungering and who are thirsting for righteousness. It's a continual craving, a constant gnawing within, a perpetual appetite. It's a common biblical metaphor for intense longing and deep craving. But let's be honest, it's easily lost on us in the prosperous West today. How many of you have ever actually known hunger a day in your life, not sure where your next meal or drink would come from? And yet we know there are millions today living in extreme poverty, many of whom are right here on this African continent and even in this city of Johannesburg, unsure of their next meal, hunger stalking their every step. So even if this is hard for many of us to imagine, it is far harder to experience and to endure for those for whom it is a reality. Surging headaches, bloodshot eyes, swollen tongues, cracked lips. We've seen the images, haven't we? Bloated stomachs, sunken eyes, sagging shoulders, dragging feet, bitter exhaustion. This kind of overwhelming thunger, hunger, this vehement thirst was familiar to the primitive world of Jesus' day. Especially in that dry and arid and uh, near eastern desert climate. Water was a premium. Food could be scarce. You had to plan well in advance for where your meal would come from. People often lived on the brink of star starvation. They hovered around the borders of severe thirst without any of our modern conveniences, grocery stores, running water. Guess how often the average working man in first century Palestine would have meat? Maybe once a week. Sure, Texans would die. 
they knew all too well the powerful, painful craving of the body for food and drink. You don't eat, you die. No liquids, no life. Other than oxygen, name a more basic necessity than eating or drinking. And friends, Scripture is no stranger to starvation, to the horrible deprivation in times of famine or battle siege. Remember in 2 Kings chapter 6, they had a famine so severe that a donkey's head was sold for food at the exorbitant price of 80 shekels of silver. And a portion of a dove's dung went at the exorbitant price of five shekels of silver. And mothers even cannibalized their own sons. That is the grotesque desperation to which hunger can drive you. And yet, as awful as physical starvation is, the Bible tells us there is worse. There's something far more severe and even more eternally grotesque. And that is the starvation of the soul, the deepest of all cravings. A spiritual hunger, if left, that causes untold harm, endless ruin, and leads people to do the most insane of all things. And to act in the most foolish manner. And brings everlasting consequences and anguish. Remember Proverbs 27 verse 7 in the context of adultery? It says a sated, a, a full man loathes honey, but to a famished man any bitter thing is sweet. A Russian writer during the communist era once said, hungry hearts make for very vulnerable people. We all know friends like that. Maybe we once were like that. Maybe you still are. Hungry souls make for very vulnerable people. He writes, empty pockets are far less dangerous than empty souls. And yet the good news of Scripture, the glorious message of Jesus here, is that God loves to satisfy hungry souls. He knows exactly how to do it and how to keep doing it. Psalm 81, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. Could that be said? Look up here. Is your Christian life just depicted in the following fashion? That's what the Bible says. Many Christians aren't growing and aren't happy because their Christian life looks more like this. Like a person on death's bed and you just try and get a chip of ice in them so you can delay the funeral plans for another week. Loss of appetite is a mark of death. Healthy appetite is for those most alive. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for they will be filled. Psalm 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go to where he is? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope in God, for I will yet praise him. I mean, picture this buck out in the barren wasteland, languishing of thirst, despairing of any refreshment. No picture for a calendar, that's for sure. Tongue wagging, throat burning, Strength fading until, at last, the tail starts to wag. The ears are raised. They see water. They spot that river. The, the, the buck leaps forward if there's any companions. Racing and out, running all of them. Desperate for one life-giving sip. A single drink from that stream. How about Psalm 63? Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, only hungry souls talk like that. The word earnestly could also mean early. Some people wonder why I don't have a daily quiet time, why I don't spend time with the Lord. We would love to help you. Here's some steps, here's some tools, here's, here's a Bible reading plan. But if you're not hungry, all those tools will lay and collect dust until you thirst for God. And when you do, you'll find a way. Because it's not just have to, it's want to. Need to. Oh God, you are my God. Early I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh will faints for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. That's our world. In case you haven't noticed, nothing else satisfies. As Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. Remember Pascal, he said, God has put in you a God-shaped vacuum. Nothing else will fill. Stop trying to cram a square peg into a round hole. God alone will satisfy. Or do you think you're wiser than him? Do you know better than him? Who made you and who can satisfy you most? 
Psalm 63 is not done. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, Lord, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Satisfied people are the best singers. As I loved hearing you a moment ago and joining you. So, I will bless you, Psalm 63 continues. As long as I live in your name, I will lift up my hands. Oh, this is a Baptist church. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. One of the first and most impactful Christian books I ever read. I cannot recommend to you highly enough. I pulled out the copy my mom gave me yesterday and just seeing her writing and remembering the impact it had on me as a young Christian. A.W. Tozer, Pursuit of God. Read it and read it again. Tozer writes, David's life was a torrent of spiritual desire and his psalms ring with the cry of the seeker and the glad shout of the finder. (laughs) Psalm 84. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. No wonder Jesus speaks the way he does. True blessedness, real happiness, lasting joy is for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. This is the pursuit. He could have just said they do righteousness, they want it, they pray about it, they talk about it. But that's weak, that's empty. It doesn't capture the power and the intensity of this message, same as with the previous images. Poor, bankrupt, impoverished in spirit, mourning like a, the loss of a firstborn child over our sin. And so here it is, hungry and thirsty for righteousness. The true believer salivates over godliness like a starving man for a piece of bread, like a parched tongue aching for but one drop of water. Beloved, God doesn't waste his bread on mild appetites. He promises no satisfaction to snackers and nibblers and half-hearted souls that just feel a bit peckish every now and then about Sunday morning, you know, for an hour or so if I can't think of anything better to do. They just want to play at religion and toy with worship and dabble in church. Uh, Double-minded, wishy-washy, indecisive souls that just want to try Jesus like some flavor of the month. And then they wonder where the blessing is in their life. And the world looks and says, why are you no different than the world? You're just as miserable as us because there's no hunger and thirst for God. You're just playing games with the Almighty. No, says Jesus. These, and remember the grammatical emphasis each time in these Beatitudes. These and these alone, they will be satisfied. They are the blessed ones. This is a true believer. Anyone else would have reason to doubt their salvation. Well, you say, Tim, uh, flesh it out for me. I, I don't get it. Or, or I really fail in this area and I want to grow. How do I recognize spiritual hunger? How do I distinguish it from all the counterfeit appetites and pretend versions of just churchianity and religious hunger that doesn't last longer than the drive home on Sunday? Steve Lawson helps us with how to cultivate this soul thirst when it's lacking as well. He gives three marks of a soul in hot pursuit of God. Three characteristics of hungry and thirsting for God. First of all, the hungry soul is single-minded. They are single-minded. Philippians chapter 3, forgetting what is behind. This one thing I do. A hungry person says that nothing else matters until they get food, right? It's an obsession, a preoccupation, a desire that dominates their entire life. Everything else takes a back seat, no matter how legitimate How innocent, family, friends, work, pleasure, sleep, doesn't matter. i got to tell you one thing. I'm hungry. I'm starving. I'm thirsty. And so there is a restlessness. I can't sit still. I can't think about anything else. Day and night, waking, sleeping, thinking, dreaming, there is a master passion under whose grip I have been obsessed until I am quenched. Could your pursuit of God be described that way, Christian? Focused, fixed, intensely obsessed with your Lord, your first love. Like Jacob at the river Jabbok. Remember the place that got renamed Peniel, the face of God. Only after he pled with the Lord. I wonder how often is that true of us? The Lord is reserving, he's waiting to satisfy and to bless us when we want it long enough and we desire it strong enough and we pray for it hard enough and we hunger for it intensely enough until then the Lord says 
let me know when you're serious. When you're not going to blaspheme my name and, and take my name in vain. When you actually take me at my word and desire me more than life itself. Then when Jacob said, what did he say, remember? I will not let you go until you bless me. Then he was blessed. And he walked with a limp for the rest of his life, depending on the Lord as he faced Esau and all the fears that awaited him. May God give us this kind of consuming zeal. You need to ask yourself, if you don't have it, why not? What are your biggest distractions? What keeps your, your, your soul from this kind of single-minded worship? What puts you in two minds? Remember Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 11, first passage I ever preached as I think a 16-year-old. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, 2 Corinthians 11. I pledged you to one husband to Christ that you would have a, lest the serpent deceive you like he did Eve, away from a simple and pure single-minded devotion to Christ. They are single-minded. Second description of a hungry soul. They are driven and propelled. Think about it. If you're hungry and thirsty, you're consumed with meeting that need. You're desperate to be fed. You'll pay any price, travel any distance, overcome any obstacle to find food and water. You'll waste no time on other things or lesser things or anything until you are quenched. So you see people that are bored at church today, always arriving late, irregular in attendance, lazy in singing, dull in prayer, lethargic about scripture, cold towards fellowship with other believers. And whatever else you may or may not say about them and however many other virtues they have in their life, one thing is real sure, they're not hungry for God and they don't mean business with him. And they're just good at playing games. They don't hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so no wonder if they're a frustrated soul who lives an inferior, subpar, stunted Christian life. Instead of the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the third description, not only are they single-minded and driven and propelled. Third, they're humble. They're meek. Think about it. Hungry souls are submissive. They're yielded. They're, they're uncomplaining. If you're starving, you'll take food on any terms. You're not picky. You'll put your head in a rubbish bin. You'll eat leftovers from someone else's plate. You'll lick it off the floor. If you're starving, will you not tell me otherwise? If not, then you're probably not hungry. Looks like you'll be fine. Glad to know. Not so for the hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hungry souls don't need to be entertained or catered to at church. They don't care how hot, how far, how crowded, or how empty the place is. They don't care if the people are white, black, brown, or purple. They don't care about the parking, the music, the coffee, or the crash suiting their exact fancy. As long as their souls are fed, Jesus said, my sheep, hear my voice. Sheep love, sheep food. Show me where the green pastures are. I'm starving. I need God's word. That's all I ask. I talk to someone often, almost every Sunday, often with tears in their eyes, even after this morning service. Thank you for God's word. You don't know how bad it is out there. No, we're not the only church, but thank you for being a faithful church. I have been starving, pastor. You don't know how famished I've been. Just keep teaching the Bible the next verse. It has nothing to do with you. You're, 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 you're probably a weird nerd for that matter, but just keep being a voice and just keep feeding us from God's word and get yourself out of the way. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, madam. <laughs> Hungry souls won't settle for eating once a week either, just on Sundays. No. They feast on the word. Psalm 1, day and night, meditating on his law, uh, putting my roots down into the streams of living water. Every chance I can, gathering with other believers. Every opportunity in private and public. More of his righteousness. More of the Lord. More of his word. Job 23, I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Maybe you need a habit, Bible before breakfast, to readjust your priorities. Jeremiah 15, your words were found and I ate them and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. 1 Peter 2, we've had a lot of newborn babies in this church lately. Uh, no amens from the mamas on this one, if they're even here today and not exhausted and uh, uh, bloodshot eyes at home. Like newborn babes crave, long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow up. Nobody has to go to that newborn baby and say, excuse me, my alarm went off. It's time for you to want milk right now. That's dying babies. That's take them back to the hospital babies. That's failure to, failure to uh, thrive babies. Not healthy babies. Mama, mama. 
desperate for the pure milk of the word. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Tozer again. He says, the Bible's not an end in itself. It's a means by which we enter into an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God. It's through his word. We delight in his presence, says Tozer. Taste and know the inner sweetness of God himself in the core and center of our hearts. Psalm 19, right? God's word is more desirable than gold, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Psalm 119, you want a whole psalm with 176 verses of a OCD, obsessively addicted saint who is infatuated with God's word. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. I delight in your law. It's in my meditation all the day. Your commands are the joy of my heart. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I opened my mouth wide and panted. I longed for your commandments. This is Bible language. This is not preacher's excitement. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. I love the way the hymn writer puts it. Now to enjoy thee I come to thy word, on thee to feed till my hunger is o'er. Now in my spirit I turn to thee, of thee to drink till I thirst no more. Feeding and drinking, Lord Jesus of thee, feeding by reading, drinking by prayer, reading and praying, I eat and I drink, praying and reading, Lord, thou art my fare. Lord, you're my food and my drink. You're my portion and my cup. Your love is better than life, the psalmist says again and again and again. As Tozer prayed, make this your prayer. Oh God, I have tasted thy goodness. And it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I'm ashamed of my lack of desire. Oh God, the triune Lord, I want to want thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made more thirsty still. Blanchard writes, one of the greatest signs of sickness in the Christian church today is the widespread lack of hungering and thirsting after God. And then Blanchard says, you want a good gauge? A church that still has a Sunday night service. Or have they bought into this myth that people need a break from too much of God's word, too much worship, too much fellowship. Oh, shame, we don't want them to get too hungry. Not so for the thirsty soul. You can't have too much manna from heaven. You can't have too much of Jesus' living water to quench your deepest desires. Number three, not only purpose and pursuit, but number three, the promise. If we've seen the destination and how we get there, this is the arrival. <laughs> and again, notice the paradoxes within paradoxes within paradoxes in these Beatitudes. This countercultural, startling uh, statement of a happy hunger, a blessed thirst, a a fortunate craving, an enviable ache. And, And then there's double irony. Blessed are those not who find it or who obtain it. No, blessed are those who keep wanting it, who are on a lifelong quest to have it, who have a lifestyle of holy hunger and are forever characterized by this sweet thirst. If you are happily married, you know exactly what I'm speaking about. The more you are satisfied, the more you desire, and the better it gets, and the stronger your cravings, and the closer you grow towards one another. For they shall be satisfied, Jesus says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they, remember, they alone, exclusively, uniquely, and wonderfully and amazingly, they alone shall be satisfied. Satisfied, the word here, they shall have plenty, be fulfilled, be fully nourished. Hear this, friends. God is more eager to answer your request for satisfaction than you are to ask for it. He is more excited to satisfy you than you are to seek it. He is a fountain of life. It is his nature as an infinite source to supply your deepest yearnings and your purest longings. Because likeness to his son and a passion for holiness and a zeal for Christ's likeness was the reason he killed his son. It was the reason Jesus shed his blood was that you might be holy, that you might be righteous like you were made originally in his image. 
Notice, it's not an active verb here. We can't satisfy ourselves. God has to do it. We can't achieve it. He must act so that we can receive it. We shall be satisfied. Think of a tiny infant. They can hunger and thirst and scream and cry all they want. But unless mama delivers the milk, they could die in their thirst. It must be brought to them. It must be provided for them. And so too, as in getting saved and in being sanctified and living the Christian life, we cannot satisfy our own hunger or quench our thirst for righteousness by, uh, remember Galatians, as we read earlier on liberty of conscience. Uh, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Now you're trying to be perfected by the works of the flesh. God alone graciously, generously transforms our mind, renews our heart, continues to shape and mold our character and conduct into the image of his son by the power of his spirit. Please understand, the Sermon on the Mount is not calling for a lifestyle that is the product of mere human effort. It is the result of transforming grace. Philippians 2, work out your salvation for it is God who's at work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Psalm 23, when we read this, how can we not think of those words? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And the promise of Psalm 23 comes to mind. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <laughs> Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them says the psalmist, Psalm 107. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, for he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. How about Mary in her Magnificat? We sing about it, don't we? Tell out my soul. Luke chapter 1. That song of reversals, celebrating God's ironic and unexpected mercies. What were her reasons for rejoicing? Why was she so exultant, boasting in praise to the Lord? Much of which she borrows from Hannah's ancient song. Mary tells us there in Luke 1. For he has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. You're well fed. God will famish and make you hungry forever. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has exalted those who were humble. These are the Beatitudes. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent away the rich empty-handed. Mary sang. What is the biggest good thing God could ever supply to the hungry soul, if not this, righteousness? You want to talk about satisfaction guaranteed or your money back? <laughs> And you didn't pay any money. It was free. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. And you can't lose it. If you're in Christ, but you can drink in more of it. And you can taste it more deeply. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be, will be. He guarantees and promises you will be satisfied. When, you say, Tim, well, when does this happen? Is it now? Is it later? Is it on earth? Is it in heaven? Ya, nia. <laughs> Already and not yet. At justification, in sanctification, and supremely and perfectly at our glorification. Now, and then, and then, and then, oh, also, and then, and then all after that. It's like a progressive supper, right? I love the way Proverbs says, a cheerful heart has a continual feast. The Christian life is one of serial satisfaction. <laughs> Till the day that we are glorified, perfected, made completely righteous and sinless. I love the hymn writer says, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart. Is that your deepest longing? Sin has to be your greatest grief. We're back to the previous Beatitudes. Then your deepest desire is for holiness and Christ-likeness. The promise of 1 John 3, still remember John Blanchard preaching a sermon on this at Grace Church when I was a student and I missed the service. But everyone couldn't stop talking about it. It was the old days of the cassette tape and I got that cassette tape and I still remember the place on this campus where I listened to this message on the five best words in the whole Bible from John Blanchard. We shall be like him. 
He just unpacked. There was five points in the message. We, undeserving, filthy sinners, shall be guaranteed, like, conformed into the image molded. We shall be like him, Christ, Jesus, sinners like us, conformed to his image. What a glorious hope. What a perfect prize. What an undeserved gift. Psalm 17, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Psalm 16, Lord, you have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore and evermore and evermore. And oh, by the way, uh, evermore after that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They shall be satisfied and the marriage supper of the lamb when the Lord returns and takes us home to heaven while the birds feast on the flesh of the enemies of Christ under his wrath we are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb a more fabulous and extravagant reception than you have ever been invited to and he says come and dine (laughs) dine with the lamb the Lord Jesus forevermore the purpose the pursuit and the promise I close with that epic moment. We won't take time to turn there, but remember in John 7, Jesus stands up on the last great day of the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, that climactic moment in the sacred water ceremony and the outpouring and the priests, high priests, leading this procession of worshipers with the water drawn from the, 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 uh, the pool of Siloam in the spring of Gihon. And after it's poured out, now they have to wait another year until this wonderful uh, ceremony of lights and of water and of joy. And they have to return back to their homes. And Jesus uh, stands up and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Because he knew then, as we know now, people are drinking, as Jeremiah says, from these broken cisterns and putrid water, and their face and their nose is down in the muck of life and the filth of the world. And Jesus offers infinite satisfaction and living water. Why would you not drink? Will you not come now? The same Jesus who says in John chapter 4 to an immoral woman who was on her fifth man and life had left her high and dry and bitten and twisted and empty and frustrated. And Jesus says, I have water you know nothing of. You drink of this, you will be satisfied forever. In John 4. And the same Jesus in John 6 who says, after feeding the 5,000, but that's not enough because they're still demanding more miracles. He says, no, you don't get it. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who comes to me will never thirst. Do you believe this? You understand there's a condition. It's not automatic. You have to forsake all other sources. You have to leave all of the junk food and all of the idols and all of the love of self and of this world. You have to repent and believe. You have to come, Jesus says, and you have to drink. Come and dine, he says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. I remember when I was a teenager, I think I was only 15, I think it was the same summer I got saved, I think it was actually the summer before, and I, it, I didn't get the point for another year, I struggled with thirst, and, but I still remember this handicapped man who hobbled up to the pulpit and preached John chapter 7, and, I, and it was a tent, and it was hot, and I still remember his voice declaring on the authority of God's word with the authority. The, the, the command of Jesus himself, whoever th- is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And I remember in my heart going, I'm so thirsty. Life does not satisfy. I need something that will stick. And I think it was only a year later that I actually got saved and really came to Christ in a genuine faith. Not playing games, not fooling around, not just showing up at church and doing the Jesus thing, but I fell on my face and God have mercy on me, a sinner. I am hungry, I'm thirsty, I need your salvation. Please have mercy on me. Forgive me because of your blood on the cross and your empty tomb. Through Jesus, satisfy my soul. And I can tell you, it's satisfaction guaranteed. It only gets better. (laughs) I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. Let's pray. Our Father, you know full well it was eating that brought us death. And it's eating 
that brings us life. The first Adam ate and we died. But if by faith we feed on Jesus, the Son of God, the second Adam, in him we find life everlasting, forgiveness of our sins, perpetual satisfaction. We say with that saint of old, we taste thee, O thou living bread, and long to feast upon thee still. And we drink of thee, the fountainhead, and thirst our souls from thee to fill. Teach us, O Lord. Save lost, thirsty, hungry souls in this room now, today, O oh God. And teach us as your children more of this spiritual awakening, more of this yearning and hunger and thirst for your righteousness and for a life of service to you and a more intimate walk with you. In your son's name we ask, amen. Please stand for our benediction. Look out for a face that may be new to you, many of those around lately, and let's show the love of Christ and minister to one another. Let me or our staff know if there's any way we can serve you or care for you, counsel you in any way. It would be our joy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Amen.